medicine doesn't cover for. Um, like in a lot of cases, the specificities of different types of pain. Um, and what happens oftentimes, like we talked about previously, is we end up giving the wrong treatment to the wrong patient. Um, but what we do is we run around and say things don't work or, or whatever. So um, what do they say? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. So you can pretty much make statistics say just about anything. And, and the companies with the most amount of money are very capable of doing that, right? So, so think about this. Like evidence-based medicine, clinicians should be aware of it, but that shouldn't be the only guiding effort that they have. That should be a base, right? Like you're aware of what may or may not work, and then you use your clinical reasoning skills to basically identify which patient population is going to do well with, with certain therapies. So we could take a normal Gaussian distribution, which I talk about a lot, right? Like normal one first derivative is around 66%. So anything outside of that 66% is by definition abnormal. So, for example, if we use that as our, our outlier of what therapies we're going to give, so we're not going to treat the 33% like they have any meaning at all. Like, for example, we'll say, you know, I'll just make up a number for now. Say cupping works on 33% of people. Okay. And we're going to say that, you know, 66% of people respond to some other therapy. Let's, let's pick something, some medication. Uh, Uvidal. Okay. So... When we have 15 patients a day and we give the medication to 10 patients, they're going to respond well to it, but the other five will not to the same extent. But, you know, you don't just keep giving everybody that medication just because that's what the research says works well, right? So if the other one works in the 33%, it may be those other 33%. But the importance as a clinician is finding out who that, that is, and that's why there's expertise. That's why there's clinicians. That's why we talk about clinical uh, skills. You have to be able to think and problem solve. Otherwise, we wouldn't need doctors at all. We would just have robots that follow out a formula. Oh, your A1C is this, but here's your medication. Oh, your blood pressure is this, but here's your medication. The other problems with these are shifting guidelines, particularly when it comes to like cardiovascular health or things like that. You know, we keep moving the bar on certain things to include these as disease states. So it's like blood pressure, right? Like 120 used to be okay, but now we're saying 120 to 130 is prehypertension. It could be a cause to be medicated. Well, my argument would be, like, where do these numbers come from? When do we decide that 122 was a pathological disease state and 118 was not? Mm -hmm. Again, these are, these are not individualistic. These are guidelines for healthcare plan administrators and for governments and public health administrators because they need some level of guidelines. But probably most of them are arbitrary. When we talk about our normal values on, like, a CBC chart, where do those numbers come from? Like, where do we extrapolate the data to begin with to make these numbers that the cutoff mark for diabetes? Like, these are good questions, right? Like, I've never had anybody actually answer them fully because people are so caught up in the dogma of what we have, we don't even ask why we have them, right? So your body doesn't really know the difference between 122 and 118 as far as systolic blood pressure, right? So physiologically, it's four points apart. It's, it's the same four points relatively as 118 to 114, but you're going to medicate one and not the other? It would be nice if we could come up with some truism that would actually be able to bridge the gaps in these kind of thought processes, right? Like, like wh why do we have these cutoffs? What makes six weeks worth of physical therapy the cutoff versus four weeks or ten weeks? Why is midline tenderness an, an indication for an x-ray, but radi radicular pain is not? We well, could understand the thought process from the beginning because point tenderness could mean a, uh, you know, a fractured spinous process. If the history made sense... But otherwise, if I just poke somebody on their spine, and, and you guys know this, you're doing markings, and they have point tenderness, well, that's actually an indication to get an x-ray medically. But that doesn't make sense without the history. If you fell on the ground, on the concrete, you slipped on ice, and then I touched you on your spine and said it hurt a lot, and I felt some movement, that's a, probably a good reason to get an x-ray, right? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, clinicians don't have the nuance to really break things down and look at things um, through a critical thinking perspective. You know, it's like we talked about last class, like, say chiropractic or, is, well, yeah, well, say cupping. Cupping works in 33% of people, right? So um, which group of people? You have to understand physiologically what it does first. People with fascial tightness or superficial skin, you know, pain or myofascial pain syndromes. Is cupping going to be super helpful for somebody with a broken bone? No. Or a spinal fixation? No. Or disc herniation? Probably not, right? So if we're quantifying, say we're studying cupping, for example, and this is an arbitrary number, but we say it works in 33% of people with neck pain. Well, the question is, did the clinical uh, provider, were they able to actually identify which patients would do well with it first? Because that's the goal, right, is to select those groups out to where you give those 33% the right therapy. If you said, if you were able to differentiate the spinal, 
you know, issues from these people. We eliminated their disc herniations. We eliminated the fractures. We eliminated all these other things to where we only had people with myofascial pain. Now the odds of this working are like, you know, 80 or 90 percent, right? But the problem with research is, is you're, you're creating, statisticians hate that kind of stuff because you're, you're creating your own sample sizes to benefit yourself. So that's actually contraindicated in, in research. Like, you can't do that. That's creating a, a biased sample. And you can't blind the clinician then, right? Like, but that takes away the uniqueness of what a clinician is, their ability to identify which patients do well with certain therapies. Does that make sense? And that's one of the problems with evidence, like in evidence-based medicine. Not, I'm, and I'm not saying I have a problem with evidence-based medicine, but I'm saying that in a dogmatic way, you can't use that as the guideline that causes you to treat every single patient. Because like we said, if those 15 people come in, you just ignore the other five because everybody should only use this because this is the only thing that works in greater than placebo effect of the patient. Because right? you need to be around or at least better than placebo 50%-ish if we're assuming that placebo helps 50% of people. So if you're at 66, that's cool. If you're at 33, that's not. So then we don't ever use the stuff that works 33% of the time, but we didn't actually identify why it works 33% of the time. And, and the truth is that it could be that it's because those certain patients got the therapy, right? So even, so we were talking about the Katie May thing last week, like the, the model that died. So I, I went and looked up all the information on it, right? So I pulled up the autopsy. So the autopsy showed bilateral vertebral artery dissection. Right? Not, not one side, two sides. Okay, so say we take the most aggressive number on the, the amount of vertebral artery dissections caused by manipulation. That would be about 1 in 5,000. Okay, the way statistics work is to have two of them, you're going you're gonna to multiply the denominator. The odds of having two of those in one incident now goes to what? Like 2.5 million? Or 25 million, right? Yeah, so 5,000 times 5,000. So we have a 1 in 25 million chance of this being the causative effect. That doesn't mean that it couldn't happen, but it also makes it a lot less likely, okay? And then we take the more aggressive estimates, you know, uh, 1 in 1.5 million, and you multiply the 1.5 million times 1.5 million. I don't know what that number is, trillion, right? That's the odds of that happening. But what we were talking about before is there's probably a patient segment or population that doesn't do well with that because they have either Marfan's disease or EDS or some other underlying causative, you know, issue to where they're susceptible to dissections, and we're thinking that may be the cause, right? Like that's, that it wouldn't take much in this particular person to cause that. Looking at those odds, right? Like they're probably very susceptible to this. So it could have been them getting their hair washed. It could have been them changing lanes. You know, we can't ignore the probability that there's a biological plausibility that it happened because, I mean, it's certainly plausible. But again, we talked about the biases, right? Like, like neurologists are going to be asking people who have strokes if they saw a chiropractor because they're looking for that. That's a bias um, in their own. So if they said, yeah, I saw a chiropractor, whether it had anything to do with it or not, or it was the same side or anything else, now there's a causative component attributed to it by the neurologist. So now we're greatly overestimating the amount of cases because we haven't been able to prove any kind of causation. We just attributed causation in a temporal way, which isn't how research or science work at all. Right? So like, if you ask them any of the patients that were having strokes if they had put deodorant on that day, and then the patients that did, we'd be like, oh, see, deodorant caused a stroke. I mean, it sounds ludicrous to say, and again, I'm not making light of the biological plausibility. There certainly is, and there's enough anecdote to think that there are some cases caused by it. You know, in my opinion, I think those cases are a combination of, of bad diagnostics to begin with, right? Not doing enough of a, an exam, uh, probably some sort of genetic susceptibility to it, and then but poor technique. When you combine those things, now you're playing with fire. Maybe, <laughs> right? As, as a true researcher, not a, not a healthcare clinician, as a true researcher, it's pretty hard for anybody to actually make that um, causative effect. The only reason why it is is because the potential damage is so great, right? It's such an emotional issue. So we err on the side of caution because that's what we do as humans when we're not being rational using statistics and saying, well, statistically, this is a very likely to happen, so it's okay. But we're okay with one in 33 strokes and heart attacks from a, a surgery because that's considered an acceptable risk for some reason. Like, I've got this patient in right now. She's, uh, she's 78. They want to do a, a knee replacement on her, and it's a tricky age group for this. She's not super healthy. So, you know, what are the odds of her coming out of this operation alive? You know, if 1 in 33 get a stroke or a heart attack as a, as, a res as a result of surgery, extrapolate that data and imagine how many of those numbers come from the elderly. 
one in three, one in five, when we're talking over 65, 70 degree, you know, years old, because we're talking clotting, right? Mm-hmm. So incorporating that with MRSA risk and with other types of infection, like, you know, is this worth the risk? Are you really that disabled? You know, if she was 57, it's a much safer procedure for her. You know, plus she has a lot more years on the line to be healthy. So it's like we're, we're trying to find this balance to where they don't die, but they're also not miserable, right? Like, and then you have to decide, like, is a miserable life worth living? If she can't ambulate around, if she can't walk, if she's in miserable pain, it may be a risk she's willing to take. So we can't really tell her otherwise. That's, that's not what people, you know, in America with liberty believe in, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we wouldn't want people telling us we can or can't have a procedure that we want to do. You know, it's, it's a tricky situation. And we all have our own, like, hypocrisies, right? Like, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I think it's interesting that so many people that are pro-choice are so gung-ho on forcing vaccines. Like, you can't tell me what to do with my body except when you try to force me to, to inoculate. Those seem like they might be opposing viewpoints in, to some extent. Um, particularly something like a seasonal flu shot, right? Particularly this year. That its efficacy is rated 10 to 15%. You know, you're going to force somebody to inject chemicals in their body? Like, that doesn't seem like a lot of liberty to me. And the question is, is, like, do we make decisions based on personal freedom or do we, make, do we automatize everything and make everybody have to eat healthy? You're not allowed to make any decisions. And in my opinion, I, I kind of feel like you should be allowed to make your own opinions, but you should also be responsible for your actions if you're informed of the consequences. That's just my personal views. Like, like I said before, I think if you want to eat Big Macs and, and crap, I mean, by God, you're, you're a human being. I don't think it's my choice to tell you that you absolutely cannot do that and knock the cookie out of your hand or whatever else. I think you should be informed of the potential consequences, and if they happen, then you should be responsible for it because, you know, you're aware of it. Yeah, you can't go back and sue Mickey D's for making you fat. People try. I know. Some people have done that. Yeah. Um, So, you know, like, it, and, and when it comes to death, like, there's such an emotional reaction to it because we don't really deal with death, right? Like, we don't really do it. Like, we say we know we're going to die, but we don't live our lives that way. We live our lives like we're going to live forever. We say that we know we're going to die, but imagine if you had a date that you were going to die. Like, how much that would change the the, uh, the, the trajectory of your life. Even if you knew you were going to die at 70 or 75, right? You'd be like, oh, here are all the things that I want to accomplish before then. Let me get my stuff together. Yeah. Even though we know the average age of death is like 73, so more than likely we'll probably die somewhere around that time. Even though we could die tomorrow or whatever, we could live a long time too. But like you would think that you would take the trajectory of your life based on that information, but we don't. We act like we'll live forever. That's, it, we can't help it. It's, it's ingrained. We've never been dead before. <laughs> it's, it's not a real possibility in our brains. We, we say it out now, we acknowledge it, but we don't actually congruently put that thought together in our heads. Because we've never been dead. You can't do something you've never been before. You can't imagine a color you've never seen before. You can't imagine what you were doing before you were born, by the way. Like, what were you doing? <laughs> what were you doing before five? I don't know. <laughs> well, you're told what you were doing, right? Like, but you don't actually have like real vivid memories. You might have false memories. Yeah. Like a lot of like, I remember I had this false memory for a while as a childhood. It must have been a dream or a TV show or something. But like, I was thoroughly convinced that I was picking a flower off a cactus and I saw a pterodactyl fly by. <laughs> like, I, I thoroughly believed it. I thought it was real. I have a I have a memory, or I used to have a memory of Santa Claus flying over my head. Like, I mm-hmm. totally believed it, and I would tell kids that. Like, mm-hmm. I have a memory of a evil squirrel. Yeah, it's it's as real as any other memory, right? Like, totally. Yeah, but we, I think we can logically say that those things didn't happen, right? Like, it was a dream. It was a dream. yeah, a dream that you know, and again, you remember it in some way, sense, or you combine memories. Because the, here's the thing: is like, in order to remember something, you have to reconjure it again. That's how memories work. Unless you have some sort of autism or something like that, like you have to remember it. That's why when you guys are studying, you need reps. Mm-hmm. When you get enough reps, you start to crystallize your intelligence. We talk about the difference between. Um, fluid intelligence to crystal intelligence, crystal intelligence stays with you. Your crystallized IQ goes up as you age. Your creative IQ actually peaks at about 22 to 25 and goes down from there. Really? Yeah, so our problem-solving skills are constantly going down now, but we have more wisdom because we have more gross information overall. That's what we call wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know better (laughs) because you've seen it. Um, So the way that we create those memories is we re-remember them. So it's like making a photocopy of a photocopy. It starts to get smudged and blurred and it changes. And if you guys have ever gone to like a playground that you went to as a kid or a school or something, it doesn't look like you remember it. Mm-hmm. 
one, because your perception was different then, and that's how you stored that memory. But two, you've also changed it over time as well. So it may seem much smaller than you remember. Yeah. Which makes perfect sense, because you were smaller, so the world looked bigger. <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's one of the ways that it shapes perspective. What was I talking about when I started this ramble? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so again, talking about, like, evidence-based medicine, literally, like, think about how an insurance company works. Like, their profit is designed by not paying for things. That's literally their business model, right? They take your money, and they make money by not paying for things. If they paid for things, they wouldn't stay in business. You know, we did talk about how they're subsidized to a certain extent as well, but, like, they are using that data in order to not pay for things, they have massive amounts of cash to invest in studies. And in the scientific studies, what, the null theory, right? Like you're supposed to try to prove something wrong. That's actually the scientific method. Yeah. Anybody out there trying to prove something right or prove something exists is actually not doing science. You're actually supposed to try to prove it wrong. And then when it isn't proved wrong, then you admit that it's right. You don't go out with an intent. And that's something like, again, this is the difference between researchers and clinicians. Like clinicians think in that mindset so they go out to prove what they know anecdotally works but that's not actually real science and then researchers don't have any nuance or ability to critically think about how a patient reacts or doesn't react to things because they look at it more in like a mathematical histological type of way so it's really hard to bridge those gaps between the two like they're almost by nature opposed so when you're looking at that kind of research like you don't think and, and we talked about like the medications right they actually can create new medication groups in order to create evidence basis for a new medication like diabetes they'll come up with new or what, what are all the different like women terms they've come up with now women yeah they've got like um pmdd and like um premenstrual dysmor or whatever disorder and of course there's a medication for it um like like sexual you know arousal blah 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 disorder uh non-24 like all these new diagnoses that when you create a new diagnostic category, if you're creating the diagnostic category, then it's actually fairly easy to come up with a medication that does that purpose, right? Like, <laughs> so you already know beforehand that your medication will work. So you can actually be scientifically true, but you've already rigged the game. Also, by the way, there's many instances that have been admitted to of researchers, not just pharmaceutical, but regular researchers, in not reporting negative studies because if they don't get anything right, then they don't get grants. Like, their, their way, a lot of scientists, their way of living is because of grants based on whatever premise they have. And they can become so emotionally tied to an idea that now they're actually more biased than they were to, to begin with. And you'll see that across the board, whether it's climate science or vaccine science or whatever else. Nobody ever changes and goes to the other side. They just dig their heels in more and look for more research to support their ideas. And if you want to find research to support an idea of yours, you're probably going to find something. Well, well, no, I mean, there's, there's case studies, you know, that show up in a peer-reviewed, you know, journal that doesn't make it science that's a case study. It wasn't controlled in any way that's appropriate for science. But we also know that we're humans, and there's no real scientific way to analyze a lot of things, like pain, for example. Like, at least you can quantify blood pressure and, and lab values and things like that. Pain is a very subjective experience, but we try to quantify it using a QVAS scale or, or, or something else of that matter. But there's no way to correlate what somebody else's pain feels like to somebody else. Right. Like my, you, my 10 is somebody yeah. else's yeah. versa. I mean, you will ne the, the, the greatest tragedy in life is never being able to truly see the world through somebody else's eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Even when we try our best, which is what empathy is, right, which is what we try to do, you still can never do it. You're chemically different. You're neurochemically different. Your lifestyle history is different. I mean, even looking at the world, like I was looking out the window the other day at something, and there was a bright light, and I was like, Carlos, do you see that? And he couldn't see it, and, and I realized that he's like two inches shorter than me. So our worlds were different. Like, he was like, no, there's nothing out there. I was like, dude, there's totally something out there. But assuming that his height was my height. That's funny. Right? So then as a clinician, as a chiropractor, PT or whatever, like, you, you start to look at the world from your perspective, and you assume that the other person views it in that way as well. It's a really bad assumption to make. In fact, you're better off assuming the opposite and then hoping you meet back in the middle. That's good relationship advice. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, think about that. We all come from different families. We have different ideas of what, like, a woman or a man or whatever should be. And most of that's based on our parents or our upbringing. Like, like uh, you know, if 
if you're expecting something in a spouse or something, oftentimes your idea of what that looks like is your grandfather, your father, your mother, or whatever. So all of a sudden you're expecting those ideals on somebody who came from a completely different background. Yeah, for sure. How, I mean, it couldn't possibly be the same. How could it possibly? And then we start mixing cultures and, and like, and you carry those expectations. So, and that's the problem, right? When we want, we want something out of the other person more than who they are. We want them to fulfill a role in our life instead of loving them for who they are. That's, that actually is a problem. Mm-hmm. We want them to be something. So you're almost using them in a way in that sense. And that's like, it's kind of not love, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah. So I think it's important that we're, we're talking about the evidence-based medicine is to, to acknowledge the research. But like that, we can't be dogmatic in that sense and just say that this is the end-all, be-all. And like I said, you get these young clinicians, and they read an abstract, and they decide that that's, that's it. They didn't look at the sample size. They didn't look if it was a meta-analysis. They didn't look if it was an RCT. They didn't look at the different levels or hierarchies of evidence. Um, but it was in a peer-reviewed journal, which, by the way, there's levels to that as well. You know, there's, there's a lot of journals that things are published in that aren't really highly respected. And even if something is highly respected, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's true. Hello, everybody. Right, like the CDC in 1952 said that smoking doesn't cause cancer. Well, you know, if, if, I don't know if they were intentionally being, you know, uh, deceitful or not, or they were just basing things off of evidence at the time, but we know that they were wrong. But, you know, as a clinician at that point, do you fight it or do you say, all right, this is the best evidence available and just repeat the company line, even though you've seen enough cases? Like, it's a very tricky thing to balance the two. And the science is constantly evolving. If you said the world was round 200 years ago, or even, even if you said that, that microbiome uh, was the cause of disease 100 years ago, you'd be laughed out of the room. You know, we didn't know what bacteria and viruses and things like that were. So based on the knowledge at the time, all of a sudden you're a charlatan, even though you could have been ahead of your day. Now, we are subject to the knowledge of our time, so it's very difficult to look beyond. In fact, we usually look to the past to find differences between the current ideas because how could we look to the future because we've never been there, <laughs> right? So it's, it's tricky, so in retrospect. But we also have to acknowledge that some ideas out of the past do hold some merit as well. And in fact, like a lot of research now is finding a lot of old folk remedies actually are beneficial. Like there's enough studies that show that they are beneficial, like olive oil, for example. They're showing that olive oil given to children can actually decrease the incidence of Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, and other types of auto-inflammatory diseases. Well, my grandpa used to take two shots of olive oil every month and said it was good for him to clean out his insides. He didn't know why, but there was enough anecdote and enough evidence at the time that people knew either subconsciously or through anecdote that it worked. We didn't have RCTs at the time to prove that, and unfortunately, as those wagtails ran into the age of evidence-based medicine, they were completely washed out for 50 to 100 years until we actually started studying them again. They said, oh, sorry for calling you a quack for 30 years. That worked. And you like they always say, the front page is where they put the, the story and then the retractions on page six. So you set the cultural narrative up front, and then it's hard to come back from that. And that's one of the problems that chiropractic has run into over time, and one of the problems that you guys can learn the lessons from chiropractic and physical therapy and do the opposite based on certain situations. You know, what are some of the, the knocks against chiropractors, right? Like overtreatment, um, fraudulent insurance billing, um, using the exact same therapy on every single patient. And it's the, it's the same idea we talked about before. You know, if, if 20% of patients respond to chiropractic, but I adjust every single person that comes in the door, 80% of people I'm either giving the wrong treatment to, which means they're either going to be wasting money or they might be worse. If 10 or 12% of people have diabetes and they get Actos, um, you know, those patients will do well, but the other 88 are actually going to be sicker. And it sounds ludicrous when we frame it in that perspective, right? Like, you wouldn't give everybody diabetes medication. Well, you also wouldn't do soft tissue on every single person either, right? Now, I would make the argument that the vast majority of people do well with soft tissue work and exercise as opposed to manipulation or injections or those other things. Um, And that's based on anecdote from, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. But you have to, as a clinician, acknowledge when something isn't working and when something is working. Like, when something isn't working, you can't blame the patient. You can't say, oh, you're just not doing your exercises, even though sometimes they're not. What you have to do is take the onus onto yourself and say, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to do different? Do I need to approach them differently? Do I need to change the way that I'm talking to them to change the frame of the conversation? Because even the way we frame our conversations matters to a patient. Like if, so here's two ways of me telling you to do your exercises. Uh, Anthony, so go ahead and do the lacrosse ball on your neck a couple times a day. And uh, yeah, go ahead and stretch a little bit too. Okay, do you think that's going to sit home the same way if I stop, I look him in the eye and say, Anthony. 
if you don't do these exercises, you're not going to get better. You have to do these exercises twice a day. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and your money. How many times a day are you going to do it? Okay. So those had, they, were, they were literally the same message, but the way that they were framed is going to create a completely different response from the patient. One is a monotonic, you know, just bland you know, way of communicating that goes in one ear and out the other, and it makes it feel like it's not that important. The things that you need to drive home as a clinician, you have to slow down. You have to make eye contact. And one thing you have to do is change the variance in your tone and create pauses. Pauses create understanding. Like when you pause, you hold eye contact. Silence is awkward for people. And so if there's silence, they may feel like there's something they need to pay attention to. If you're just... So the message that you have, like if you're telling somebody, listen, it's, it's normal to be sore. If you're feeling sore, it's okay to take ibuprofen. You should probably ice it. You could take some magnesium, but it's normal. Right? These are little verbal tricks that you use. You should beat that in their head. You've said it multiple times. So then when they're feeling sore, they're like, oh, he did say that was normal. But if I just throw it in the mix, if I'm like, all right, here's your homework sheet. My email's right there at the bottom. Expect to be normal. I'll see you next week. <laughs> so when they're sore, all of a sudden they may think something's wrong. They may, you know, some people will, will be forward enough to, to address you about it, which at least gives you the opportunity to discuss it and, and let them know about it. But a lot of patients may self-select themselves out, and they may think something's wrong, and then they're going to be out there telling people that you made them worse or, you, you know, you did something else, but you don't even know about it. Think about that. Which is why, like, I, I always tell people, like, I can't do it now, I'm just too busy for it, but when I was building my practice, one thing I always did was I called my patients the next day after their first visit. Even if you just left them a voicemail, just, you know, I would call and say, hey, this is Dr. Hightower, I wanted to check in on you, see how you're feeling. I wouldn't say, are you feeling good, are you feeling bad, it's more of an open-ended question. So then you leave the silence there, and then they will fill it in. Oh yeah, I'm feeling a lot better, I'm kind of sore, you know, da-da. okay, like we said, that's normal, make sure you ice it, but what you should notice over the next few days the soreness will go when you'll notice your original pain isn't there as much. The next time you come in, you'll be less sore and will continue to progress. It's a liability for telling people to ice. There's a lot of it, it can be high. I, I usually don't do it for multiple reasons. One, um, more of the research is showing that it doesn't actually do anything beneficial. Like, keep this in mind. Like, when you're working on somebody's tissue, you are causing inflammation, right? Like, you're breaking down mm -hmm. tissue, which is good for them, right? Like, you need inflammation to heal. Like, a lot of times, what may be working for us is almost like a prolotherapy in a way. Like, we're breaking down tissue enough to where you get blood supply to it, to where you actually bring healing factors into healed tissue. Now, all of a sudden, if you're taking anti-inflammatories or icing it, you know, icing is going to decrease viscosity of blood in the area, so now you're not getting the healing in there as well. So that could potentially slow healing. Anti-inflammatories certainly could do the same thing. So in the end, even though you're, you're trying to help them not be as sore, you may actually be doing something detrimental to the course of their therapy. Does that make sense? Um, there's a, yeah, the two the two most common medical liabilities in one of your practices are going to be heat and cold because people get burned. That and tape, right? Like, if you're using tape, man, be careful. You know, we've been getting a lot of rashes lately in our clinic, so something needs to change. Either you know, and, and this is where we use our, our problem solving ability, right? Is it lotion? Are we putting too much alcohol in there? Is there too much stretch on the tape? Or are we not identifying the right patients to tape? If it's everybody, it's probably not the population, right? It's, it's either our taping technique or something on the skin. Or it could be the tape, right? Like it could be need to change brands of tape. Like yeah, but what you've got to do is select them individually. You have to do one thing at a time. You have to control your variables. It's the same thing you're doing when you're treating. If you have a shoulder injury, you can't treat everything at once. You need to treat one thing and then recheck it. That way you can create your worldview, your frame of what's working and what isn't. So if you, if you suspect it might be the lat as the main culprit, you treat the lat, it's way better. What if you treated the lat and then you treated the super a bunch and turned the super off and then you had a net neutral? You wouldn't actually know that your, your lat treatment worked because you didn't retest it. So now your worldview is off and you don't think it has any value because you didn't actually do the due diligence to recheck them yourself. So going back to what we were talking about last week, um, something better to say would be, you know, when I'm sore, I like to use heat and ice, you know, more than 10 minutes at it, a time. It, like, it depends, right? Like, that's probably not a conversation for the office. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes, you know, this is a tricky situation. I still tell people to expect to be sore, that way they're not surprised by it. 
But you could also be creating a nocebo effect, too. Where when they expect to be sore, maybe they weren't going to be until you put it in their head, and now they're looking for it. So I wouldn't go on too much about it and, like, you know, talk about heat and cold and all that other stuff because it creates a bigger issue out of it than it actually might be. Um, you could even just tell them if you're feeling a little bit too sore, just email me or call me. It does happen sometimes. It's normal, but, you know, it's something I would worry about. And it's important, and even conversationally with your patients about certain things, like you can acknowledge something serious going on without scaring them, right? So you could even set up a frame like this. You say, okay, if we don't get any change out of this, we need to acknowledge, you know, that there might be something else going on. Like sometimes, uh, demographically speaking, you know, somebody's got some weird stuff going on. Here are, here are the potential options. It could be your scalenes. It could be your vertebral, you know, body. You know, if this doesn't work, we may need to do some imaging. Just we want to make sure that nothing serious is going on. Hint, hint, wink, wink, not judge. You don't necessarily need to verbose the fact that they could have, you know, apical lung cancer. When you do that, you create an issue in their mind. So it's important to acknowledge that there might be something serious going on, but not necessarily spell it out in those words. But if you don't say that something serious is going on, then they may not think that the x-ray is necessary, and so they may not get it, and then we may have something going on that we could have caught earlier, but we didn't. So there, there is a time, if they're being resistant to it, but you know they need imaging, that you may actually have to shut the door and be like, listen, this could be very serious. You have kids. You know, I want to make sure that we're not missing anything here. Their eyes will get that big. They will go get it done. So the way that you frame all of your conversations is, is incredibly important in patient compliance, um, even from a placebo perspective, right? Like they're going to have more confidence in you as a clinician because you're addressing, you're, you're catching all their concerns at the, at the point. And what I've tried to do over the years is, is kind of collect all of those things and incorporate them into my take-home papers or my emails. Like I said, I would recommend as you guys are building practice, it, it will be a major rapport to call your patients after the first day you treat them. Doctors don't ever do that. It builds, you know, credibility with them, actually that you care about them. And it also gives you the opportunity to cut off any concerns of the past. If they're like, you know, I was having upper back pain, but now I feel it in my arm or whatever, then it gives you the opportunity to explain why that might be, if that's normal, or if they need to come back in the next day so you can take a look and make sure everything's okay. But what you don't want is that patient self-selecting out of there and then running around with something wrong potentially, um, either not getting the proper care, because you'd rather at least get them referred to somewhere to get the proper procedure than floating around in space. So if somebody actually needs surgery, if they don't know better, they may be walking around with an injury that's getting worse for four months, but if you had gotten them back in the office, you could have referred them over and gotten them the right care. Like, we've seen that in the past with people um, with, like, true neuropathies. Like, they let it go too long because the physical therapist or chiropractor or whoever they were seeing just kept going on with it, and then they end up losing, like, permanent nerve feeling. Where if they would have gotten them the operation earlier, they could have saved their nerves. Right? So you need to, you need to figure out your timeline, too. And that's, it's different for every person. As your skills grow, you'll, that, that window will shorten down. You'll know right away if this is going to be a case that you can help or not. But don't give up on yourself either as you're starting your practice. Like one of the biggest mistakes I made starting out with was if I didn't make any progress at all my first or second visit, I needed to, to understand that my skill set was still somewhat limited, but I needed to grow as well, so not just to give up right away, to keep trying and, and try some other things. Particularly if the patient is, is okay with that, right? Like, But you've got to read them. So that's how you learn and that's how you grow. Because there's going to be cases, and I, I wish I could have my first year back, like, I sent a lot of patients to the surgeon because two things. One, my ego, my narcissism in it. I felt like I was a doctor and I was, you know, I was licensed, and if I couldn't fix it, why could somebody else? Not acknowledging the skill set difference between years of experience, right? And that's why wouldn't I think that, right? Like, most people, I think, would think that. Particularly when you went through this whole, you know, you know experience, years of schooling and everything else, you might just assume. And, and again, your ego might want to protect you in assuming then it must be a surgical procedure if you can't fix it. There can't be another clinician out there that can fix it. See, I feel like I would be the complete opposite. Which some personalities will be. You know. Um, luckily, you've got enough clinicians around here that you can refer back to. You can always go to Dr. Nuzo or any of these other people to get a second opinion on it. And that's what I try to do. Um, I've got a couple clinicians in my network that if I'm not seeing results, even if they're in my practice, to get another set of eyes on it, because maybe they'll see something I'm not before we go ahead and kick them away. Unless I know for sure that this is a surgical case. Like, there was a lot of cases that I would send that I didn't know exactly what was going on, and that's not a good reason to send somebody to a surgeon, right? 
Like if, if they've got the, we'll talk about it more in our sports medicine class, if they've got the diagnostics that look like a radiculopathy or like an ACL or something like that, and you can quantify and you can diagnose exactly what's wrong with it and you know that your treatment can't help it, that's a good reason to refer those patients. But if you're just not getting results and you have no idea what's going on with it, that might not necessarily be the right reason to send them to a surgeon. You'd rather get another set of conservative eyes on it, maybe some imaging, um, and then kind of go from there. I've had, I've had my other clinicians fix things that I couldn't fix before. It's, it's good for you. It's humbling, but it's good for your ego to realize that you're not infallible. Hey, Doc, can we take five minutes? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. You know what, guys? I, mean, I want to take a, a group picture if we can in the next room.